Uh, right, good morning, everybody. I'm delighted to see we have such a full room. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we have an excellent 35 minutes, ahead, well, 30 minutes, sorry, now that I looked down at the clock, um, ahead of us that I'm going to guide you through. Um, this is a very important topic because um, I think that, once again, it's something that has been on people's minds for a long time now. Uh, we're seeing more and more third-party outlet agreements um, be a part of hotels. And the key really is getting it right. I think we're all sold on the why. What we're going to focus on today is the how, <coughs> and how that can translate into real estate value for you, increased real estate value. So I had a chat with um, Hala Matar Chafani from HVS ahead of this session. And she told me that F&B revenue can account for between 15 to 30% of an asset value. Um, in a kind of standard hotel, and up to 50% where there's a strong F&B offering. So it goes without saying that if you get it right, you're going to increase your hotel asset value. However, as we all know, having a third-party outlet agreement is not a guarantee for success, so how do you make sure that you do get it right? Now, um, we've got a great panel. We've got Miguel. So you want sit. to sit here? Or? Yeah, I might sit there, actually. I was going to sit in the oh, middle, but I think it's here. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Okay. Um, so we've got a great panel before you. Their bios are all on the website and on the app. So we're going to get straight into it. Um, as a first question, we've got, sorry, um, as a first question, um, can you just quickly tell me, Rizwan, how do you define an effective agreement and F&B success? <laughs> <laughs> we start straight. You start straight away, yeah. Okay. Um, no, but before to start and to... to to be sure that we can have a success in, in an, an existing hotel or a new hotel, I think is the, is the wish of the ownership mm -hmm. and the hotel operator. Um, I was really on the reserve when I start my first management agreement with an hotel because uh, we have a kind of, and we're trying to keep a recipe to have a success on, on our restaurant and beach club, um, starting from design, uh, kind and quality of staff that we want mm -hmm. to, to have, that it's always quite different between hotel operators and independent restaurants. Uh, so the effective contract for me, it's very simple, is what the hotelier is able to accept from us. And it can be having new supplier, new design, new mindset, um, and going up to having your own entrance, for example. Um, it's something that I find, for example, in the parquet at, uh, mm -hmm. with Twiggy. We have our own entrance, we have our own team. Uh, so yes, we have the support of the hotel, and I think it's very important because they are playing uh, the game, but I will say the, the line between the ownership, the hotelier, include the GM of the, of, the, of the hotel for us, it's very important. We want to have everybody aligned to make sure that we are going in the right, the right direction. And you've got 19 concepts open now, correct? And we five opening years. in the next, before the end of the year? Yes, 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 next one. And you're working with a great deal of different operators. Yes, well, we are working with all the landlords in Dubai, mainly. Mm -hmm. uh, we have leases <coughs> and we have management agreement. Um, and I think the, the, the new situation of the market where uh, uh, the hotels company optimize every square meters of rooms they are trying to get and and to go to the other uh, kind of vertical of their business with the spa, the wellness, the, the retail, and the F&B. Um, I think we, we start to have quite uh, warm welcoming from them to make sure that we can boost their, their real estate value. Fair enough. Sam? Uh, it really starts with the owners, but it also requires the buy-in from the operators. Um, and I think Rizvan said it perfectly. We wear two hats. And we're constantly looking at how do you increase asset value for the ownership, which is bottom line driven. How do I push NOI? And hotel operators are aligned very similarly as we are. Uh, we're more management contracts, so the operator wants to push RevPAR. It's their highest margin business. And marrying the two ultimately requires elements such as design, mapping out the guest journey, making sure that we have multiple outlets, um, creating really more of a destination, uh, giving the concepts more identity, and ultimately, you know, Rizvan said it perfectly, uh, F&B more and more so is the soul of these properties, mm -hmm. and we're oftentimes caught between the two. Right. Um, and that's where we lean heavily into leading with the design, having multiple outlets, 
uh, creating real destinations that have identity versus just another hotel restaurant and being brought in early. That's, that's the other part. Um, you know, the design process is key. So on that note, may I just bring in Miguel? Because I know that you are involved from the start. So why don't you tell us a little bit about kind of how, starting from the beginning, how do you map F&B within a destination? Yeah, um, so I think, so, so the first thing to do is to plan ahead. <laughs> so that, that is a good point. And actually, I was uh, hearing uh, Gustavo about all this data that you can gather before doing anything. I think it's important to, to analyze what do you want to do. Also, to, to, to take a look at the personas that will come to your location, to your F&B location, right? And not only to the demographics, but also to the motivations, to the psychographic things, so the sentiments <laughs> that he was talking about. I think it, it is even more important than the demographics, because it's that will drive them to come to our restaurants. I think that is key at the beginning. Obviously, you need to do an in-depth immersion about the asset, the location, uh, again, demographics, also the type of experience that you want to create. So that is key as well. And we cannot forget the operational mm -hmm. standpoint. So you need to think about, OK, so we need a good design. We need a good experience. But obviously, all the operations and everything that is happening back I think it's important because you can do a beautiful design, but then at the end, if it doesn't work simply because it's too complex or the operations are a little bit complicated, so it doesn't make any sense. Fair enough. So, Anil, coming to you from your perspective, you have 21 properties as you're one of Dubai's biggest landlords as a Renko, and you obviously have a really interesting case study in the Marriott on the Palm and the Hilton, identical properties next to each other. So from your perspective, and you've got a lot of F&B in those venues, from your perspective, what constitutes an effective agreement and a success when it comes to F&B? So Jennifer, uh, first of all, in those 21 properties, we have close to 100 F&B outlets. So I think we can, I, my comments today are primarily related to the Dubai market. I have to be very honest here. <clears throat> if we step back a bit, as an owner, when we sign these management agreements with the world leaders, the assumption was that they will do a great job with the F&B. It didn't turn out to be that. And <coughs> one of the reasons for that also, of course, is specific to Dubai. It's a very evolved and dynamic F&B market. I mean, the, the, the trends here and, you know, how long an F&B outlet is going to be valid is so evolving all the time that uh, a lot of our assumptions at the beginning fell through. So at that point, we started getting involved with getting specialists on board, and that's how the third-party agreements came in. Now, in the third-party agreements that my knowledge says, a lot of them in town are, from an owner's perspective, not effective. And I'll read out some of those pitfalls that we... So, just quickly, Anil, so everyone knows, what types of agreements do you mainly have in your locations? Okay, so all our agreements are where we have taken on a third-party operator on a franchise arrangement. Right, okay. Okay, we have not leased out the space, no. That's our, um, you know, owner's directive to us. So what's missing in these third-party agreements? Number one, from an owner's perspective, um, we would like the third-party operator to have skin in the game. <coughs> okay? They come up with these wonderful ideas, and uh, they sound very good, but eventually it's all about the numbers. As an owner, it's all about the numbers. So is, as, a, as a question, is that all the F&B success is to is just the revenue number, or are you looking at other aspects as well? Whatever. There could be various ways to structure the skin in the game element, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, some of them will put money into it, but we do not want to dilute the equity element of the whole asset, okay? We don't want to get involved with that. There are various ways, and I don't want to spend too much time on that. So that's one. Number two, these agreements must have a performance clause. Now, how many of these agreements, at least that I have knowledge of, have a performance clause? Unfortunately, not too many. And there, there are reasons for that. A lot of the third-party operators who came into town with the big names from abroad, etc., they said, you want us, this is our agreement. Take it or leave it. Actually. But would you, I mean, I would say that that's changed quite a bit. As you've got, 
you know, the RICAS is it's coming up and you've got a much stronger local operators. Do you th I mean, are you seeing agreements change from that perspective? Well, in terms of the man uh, hotel operator, mm. to what extent he really gets involved in the operator agreement, the third party operator of the F&B, I think he's looking at it a little bit from his selfish point of view. He wants to make sure that he does not lose control of the whole scenario. He does want to, and as an owner, sometimes he don't get sort of get caught up in between. Um, the operator wants to protect his primarily the room side of things, and that's a very fair comment, frankly. I mean, if he's got to have, a, if he's going to have a lot of guests who don't like to be disturbed with the loud noise all the time and entertainment and jing bang going till midnight or 2 a.m. He's right also in some But I ways. mean, also, in a lot of cases, I mean, Sam, you sent me the article from the Wall Street Journal. Do you want to talk a little bit about that, where you're really, you're doing the operator a favor, frankly? Listen, this is a fascinating conversation. I, I appreciate the viewpoint, because I live this every day w with our ownership. We create the box where, in New York, for example, we have a flagship at the Ritz-Carlton. We have two restaurants, two bars. It has won all the accolades. We led the design from day one, and it is purely managed. And I went to the ownership, and I said, look, if you want these brands and you want us to activate this space, it's a management agreement, you fund it, and this is what we'll assure. You will <coughs> be able to drive traffic, we'll create a locals destination, and these restaurants will make money, one. And I think that brought the temperature down, and we have a track record over 30 years. And two, we will get you the highest room rate in Manhattan. And the location is 28th and Broadway. And I was with the CEO of Marriott recently. The rate at Ritz Nomad is higher than the rate at Ritz Central Park, to right. put it in perspective. And Ritz Nomad, for those of you who've been, you know, I'm not even the, the best athlete on stage, but I can, you know, kick a football and hit the, the weed shop that's across the street. So this is still an evolving neighborhood. How that happened is we let all the design, and if you close your eyes, you walk in, you say, what is this hotel? And the article I sent you in the Wall Street Journal, they highlighted $1,000 a night, ADRs <laughs> in Manhattan. The very first paragraph, it said, Ritz Nomad is $1,300 a night in that location, 28th and Broadway. This isn't Fifth Avenue, it's not Central Park. What really did that is design and food and beverage. The rooms are very nice, it's a Ritz-Carlton, the operator is obviously a powerhouse in the reservation system, but you know, to your point earlier, we integrated as one with the operator. So I have cross-promotion from Marriott upon <coughs> pre-check-in in the email that you receive a pre-arrival. When you get to the property, upon check-in, there's cross-collateralization from the rooms to the check-in experience and then post-experience there's communication with the guests. So we're integrated with Marriott. The restaurant that's our three meal is on a corner. David Rockwell designed it. It has visibility and has become a neighborhood jaunt. And the way you have a restaurant profitable, last thing, it's not just an amenity for the hotel. So our Mediterranean concept, Zaytinia, show up on a Monday night, place is packed, it's all locals. Hotel occupancy is not that high. But we have that locals destination. We have the signature. The rooftop we've created with a lot of the activation is one of the best rooftops in Manhattan. That's how the hotel is able to get rate. Ownership is thrilled because they're getting their <laughs> highest margin business being the room rate is tops. And then all the restaurants, it's $40 million of F&B volume mm -hmm. out of this box and it's highly profitable. So it ends up being a win-win. Fair enough. And I mean, Rizwan, you've got a very good relationship, shall we say, with um, Ensmore. And so they obviously see the value that you're bringing to their owners and to their properties. How are you working with their owners and their development team? Uh, I, I think Ensmore understands that the FNB business is a local business. Uh, it's very complicated to bring someone from US or China and just trying to welcome them in the, in the Middle East market and vice versa. Uh, <clears throat> and at the same time, the, the, the F&B business is a very small business compared to the hotel industry. Um, the hotel industry are trying to step up the F&B business at their level, and with performance tests, with all these kind of uh, 
requirement, but it's very difficult for us as a small industry where we need to adapt ourselves to the local market uh, and to try to, to achieve the expectation of, at this level. So we're trying, we have a lot of success. As Sam was saying, we, we help the hotel to increase the ADR. In some of our venue, we represent maybe 20% of the profit of the hotel. So it, it it's starting considerable. to be significant. And I think also you've, you've gone into areas in hotels where right. it's previously been under, well, not activated. Right, but that is a dream for the, for the ownership in the hotel. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so just take the all day dining and please make a $10 million <laughs> revenue in my whole day dining space. Mm. It doesn't work like that. Um, the reality is we have some criteria that, that help us to, 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 to drive a, a better uh, revenue on the properties. Um, we have concepts, and I think the ownership need to study the concept and the hotel need to study the concept that they are looking for and they are choosing for their hotels, uh, going back to the noise and, and all these kind of things. So I think the partnership is, has to be uh, uh, very um, delicate on, on the choice of what we want to do. Um, but my main focus is today why we have uh, a success. We are a local business. We have the local data. Uh, 75 to 80 percent of our uh, business is coming from the regional uh, uh, and local uh, people. Um, <coughs> I, have a, I have a restaurant inside an hotel. I think the hotel is represent five percent of my revenue. Right. So, and obviously, when you are in a, in a hotel in the AFC, you don't want to have dinner in your hotel. You just want to cross the bridge and go to some other restaurant. So, Anil, from your perspective, what, uh, we've talked a bit about the concept. How important, or how do you get the concept right? Because you've put a lot of concepts into your different hotels. How do you get that right from the beginning? Well, unfortunately, I wish the answer to that was of a nice, perfect answer from an owner's perspective, but it isn't. Um, you know, this market, and the, we built our hotels over the last 20, 25 years also, the market here has evolved so dramatically. We really started with a lot of, as the, pre the previous uh, presentation said, gut feelings. Did they always work? No. Did they work sometimes? Yes. Now, with the data being more available, and unfortunately, that is also still limited. <coughs> you love to have an STR sort of of the F&B side of things. It's coming. It's in bits and pieces mm -hmm. right now. The government has the data, for sure, because uh, you know, everything is on VAT over here, so they've got all the data. And um, if some of that data could be spread out and given to clients like us, we would love that. So, you know, getting the concept right is very, very critical. There's no doubt about it. And, and for, you know, I would recommend to any owner, please go out and do your research very well. You're getting into a property that's going to be ready three years from now. Be sure you can also project what's going to be the trends in three years' time. It, the previous uh, presentation also indicated the increasing need for entertainment, and that's becoming a very major play in Dubai now, mm. uh, part of the F&B scene. So just may I, Miguel, how can you help someone like Anil make sure that, first of all, they have the right concepts yeah. and then the, the value so, will flow from there? Yes, uh, so I was here and my colleague is here, and I think that we need to change our mentality. So when, when we, because if we design a hotel and then try to feed the NFMB concept afterwards that can work and cannot work, so it's, it's like flipping a coin, it's so not something that will ensure you're doing that. So we, when we design at Leave It, so we design these experiences, so we, we like to think about everything as a whole thing, right? You know, we don't design the hotel and then think about the operation and think about the F&B. So we like to see, uh, actually Sam was mentioning that, so from the very beginning, from the check-in, how you can relate that with F and B, right? So is that something that is, the, there is a cafeteria at the lobby, there is a bar at the lobby, it's the same thing. You know, th that experience and that customer journey, I think, is crucial, right? You need to think, uh, you need to plan ahead just to make sure that everything that is going to be designed will respond to that needs. Obviously, for example, if the check-in is going to be a bar, so that needs to change everything. And, and also, you need to think about the operations behind, right? So we've seen many times hotels with big kitchens um, and operations that doesn't 
match the expectations from the owner and the operators as well, and that doesn't work. So you need to think, you need to plan ahead, you need to think about the guest, you need to think about the experience that you want to create, you need to, to map in out the journey from the very beginning, not from the moment that one person put a foot in the restaurant, but for the moment that the person just check in into the hotel. So at what stage, so ideally, Rizwan and Sam, at what stage should you get involved with an owner um, on a project? Well, it's interesting, it's two camps. New builds early on, and you're mapping out the entire journey, trying to capture efficiencies with development. So a central kitchen that does room service, it does banquets, it does the three meal. And if this is an afterthought, there's inefficiency, and you don't have this cross-selling of experiences that ultimately drops to the bottom line. I would say four to one right now, we're adaptive reuse versus new builds. And adaptive reuse, we're solving a lot of these problems and we're coming in, sometimes the hotel is over-programmed. And you're like, look, just mothball certain spaces and create more event space. And a lot of the projects we have in our pipeline right now are adaptive reuse projects where they were disjointed outlets, there wasn't central programming, they didn't look at the guest journey in totality, and we're coming over to replace operators. Um, the sooner the better on those new builds, because I think a lot of times what happens is, you know, they spent, you know, owners like yourself and he'll spend so much money building the hotel and that yet they earmark F and B space one, F and B space two. And later in the process, right, well, who do we bring to fill these spaces? Without thinking through that prior presentation, who's the demographic? What are what's the competition? How does this blend into the design and ultimately the guest experience? And Rizwan, from your perspective, um, what are the key things to look out for? What are kind of alarm bells <clears throat> if you're looking at an agreement or at a potential opportunity? What would put you off? If for me, the alarm is the franchise agreement. <laughs> I think it's the worst. <laughs> <laughs> if, if, they f if owners think that just giving them 200 pages of, uh, of uh, 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 a management book is enough to run a restaurant, I think it's the worst, uh, it's the worst start. Um, the management agreement is something that uh, brings us more opportunities to be involved, uh, to correct the things. I just, the reality is maybe 10 days before the opening, we are still, I think Sam is the same thing, we are still adjusting everything because we just realized that what we put on, the, on our drawings are not working uh, on the reality. Um, so yes, talking about having an effect, effective contract, the management agreement for us is something that... Uh, allow us to adjust everything that we need based on the knowledge and the experience that we have. Um, also, the, also, just going back to the, how we can catch the clients early, in the early stage, I think the, the hotel industry tries a lot of things. Uh, just giving at the checking a, feed, a free drinks or a free meal to drive more business to, uh, to their own uh, F&B outlet, I think we've seen that it's not working today. So Sam, you're now, just to pivot a bit, you're now opening your own hotel. So yes. you really obviously believe in the value of F&B <laughs> to drive real estate value. So tell us a little bit about that project. So we announced last week, we're launching our first uh, hotel and members club in Washington, DC called the Bazaar House by Jose Andres. It is a boutique property, ultra luxury, 67 keys. There's wellness, there's retail. And we're mapping out the entire guest journey and, and leading the process there. For us on the hotel side, and I tell all of our hotel operator partners, I'm not looking to run a hotel. I've been there in my prior life. This is meant to license and leverage this powerful global brand with a real local following to drive traffic. We lead the design, we run the food and beverage, we license the brand, and then we'll bring a third party uh, reservation system, you know, whether soft branded or other path. The biggest thing goes back to this brand identity which draws people to the property as, lo as localized as it can be. And for us, when you look at hotels within a hotel and hotel brands, we really do believe in the power and we're doubling down on the power of F&B and what it accomplishes if you have the right design and the right food and beverage. That combination integrated with the hotel operator will push rate. And we've proven it in from New York, LA, Miami, 
my prior firm that we grew and sold, we proved this out where we were owners of the hotel as well. And we're confident, you know, this, this next version of launching our own hotel flag, perhaps in partnership with one of the major operators, uh, is the direction of the future. Interesting, very interesting. And um, now we've got five minutes. Questions? Please, is there a microphone? Thank you. Um, as an owner, Anil, I'd like to uh, ask you, when you have an existing restaurant that's managed by you and you're considering an operator agreement, a management agreement with uh, an FNB specialist, is there a threshold that you say, look, if it doesn't, if it's not going to generate to the bottom line an incremental, I don't know, 30, 50 percent, double that, then it's not worth it? So that's a question to you. And then I'd want to flip that question to you, Sam and Rizwan, and ask, when you come to an owner such as ourselves and say, look, you know, why don't we take over your restaurant and do something with it? And, and I'm not saying compare those benchmarks to your best performing, but on average, what should an owner expect in terms of uplift to the bottom line for it to make sense to them? Thank you. Good question. Okay, so the uplift that I would expect from the incoming third-party operator would significantly depend on the attractiveness of my own location, firstly. That's very important. If I have got a very attractive location on the beach, lovely space laid out and everything, I'm going to have a lot of people interested in that space. So how would I measure what is it that I want to get to? And here's where the concept of peer restaurants comes in. I would look at what peer restaurants are doing, either in that same area, or even if it is a little distant, because Dubai is not that big a place, what kind of turnover are they achieving with that sort of level of space, with that much of seating, etc. And that's where I will start off and say, this is what I really would like to get to. It might take you a couple of years to get to that, but that's how I would set that, answer that question, really. And I would say simultaneously, we look at the peer set on the hotel side, and what is the comp set where you're trying to accomplish? And you would rank it where the way we measure success is, if this is your hotel comp set, you're gonna rank in the top, top quartile of that comp set, if not the top. On the F&B side, we have a track record to be able to push revenues, first and foremost. So there's plenty of case studies of hotels we've done that say, look, if you think the underwriting of this box can achieve X, more often than not, we're able to push that, again, from a lot of the cross-selling and overall programming. And then from a bottom line perspective, three meal, you know breakfast is always challenged and we're not looking to make money on breakfast, but we can control cost. Dinners, that's where we excel, for example, our signature, we have comp set to be able to push the margins on dinner. It gets very specific with venue, the meal periods, et cetera, but we break it down uh, in the underwriting to be able to show you what levers we can push that we control. Other levers, you know, again, using the breakfast example, it's tied to hotel occupancy and that's 90% of the breakfast. So you need to make sure that underwriting refle reflects that versus being a catch-all. Singleton. Hi, everyone. Anil, I'm curious. Um, of the hundred or so restaurants that you have, how many of them would you rehire if you were to see them again? And what would you do differently next time? Okay, so as I explained earlier, a lot of the, you know, because we've been building hotels over the last 25 years, um, Dubai has evolved so rapidly that, you know, we are effectively probably out of concept or not delivering what we should be on quite a few of them. Um, and, uh, you know, we have to take this, uh, you know, slowly. Obviously, you can't challenge all your 100 outlets because some of them have a role to play also in relation to the room side of things. And you've got to keep that balance. <coughs> um, so, you know, we're, we look at what is happening around us. And, you know, if we start realizing that the gap between what our guy is doing at this particular 
at, uh, outlet that we have versus, say, some peers around. And if the gap becomes unmanageable, then I think we start re-examining that we need to do something about it. Just, that's how it starts off. Just quickly, that's a question I did want to ask you as well, is that you've put a lot of concepts into your hotels. Um, at what stage do you go, it's not working? And then what action do you take to kind of get out? So you have to remember, Jennifer, that you're also invested in the outlet. I mean, there is a reasonably large, significant capital investment there. So you have to also give it time. So how, how, but how long would you give it? Um, you know, you, I, I, in a normal situation, when you get a, a new concept, you should know within a maximum of two years, is it going to work or not work? In the Dubai market, for sure. That would be the outside kind of limit. And I would therefore start structuring my performance clauses with certain parameters which revolve around those kind of, uh, you know, thoughts on that. Interesting. And one final question, anyone? Yes, um, I think what you're saying uh, that uh, you're outsourcing the F&B because the hotel brands have failed. But you start adding up the numbers, your four or five percent uh, license fee for the restaurant plus a one percent uh, sales and marketing. Then you look at the hotel, two and a half and maybe 50 percent GOP plus their sales and marketing. You're getting up to 13, 14, 15 percent of gross revenue before you've even sold a taco. Uh, why, why are you paying, especially, Neil, with your license, why the, the hotel, the brand is managing the property? Why are you paying them the same management fee when you have to outsource because they can't do it? Shouldn't there be a reduced management fee for that? Don't listen to them, Neil. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's another panel session, Scott. I, mean, I think it's that's just, a whole another, it's just a lot, that's it's another a lot of 45 fees before minutes. you've sold anything. Okay, uh, well, <laughs> you know, at the end of the day, there are a lot of things from a percentage of the top line point of view that the owner over the last 25 years has lost control of. And we don't want to talk about booking.com right now, do we? <laughs> okay, so that's a big number in itself. At the end of the day, yes, there is duplication of percentages, etc. But frankly, as an owner, I don't want to unnecessarily nitpick here. If the guy performs, it's going, to, it's going to make a very significant difference. And that's the key to us. We really don't then bother a bit about a percentage or a percentage there. If he does not perform, Throw him out. That's how it is. Mm. I'm not going to talk about a percent here and a percent there. I mean, some of the numbers you've been talking about, Rizwan. But, but that's why, just to jump yeah. on that, that's why companies like Enismo mm. jump on, on, on the opportunity. Uh, they understand quite uh, early that the lifestyle element in their, in, their, uh, in their hotel will be part of their F&B, and that's why uh, Enismo acquires some... Uh, uh, some shares with us, and they own also Paris Society. So, a company like Enismo owns today 40 different brands with different concepts that they, can tap yeah. in their hotels. With avoiding to lose their fees, uh, creating more revenue, more bottom line. So, it's the evolution of the hotel operators that we're seeing. So, just quickly, in two seconds, because uh, I'm going to get in trouble. Um, what is your top tip to hotel owners, such as this gentleman, for effective third-party agreements to boost your hotel asset value? Uh, create identity and integrate us with the hotel operators, uh, with multi-outlets to create efficiencies. Anil? Get the concept right. Do your research up front. That's <laughs> where a big, most of the big mistakes are being made. Miguel? So I, I would say the coordination between the owner, the operator, and also the, the experience that you want to create, and obviously thinking about the operations behind. I think that is key as well. Fabulous. Yeah. Rizwan? Yeah. Don't forget that the restaurateur is a small industry. Be generous with them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much.